what, what does all this have to do with Taylor geometry? Of course, what, 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 we, what we want is to fit our problem of studying um, Taylor-Einstein metrics or, or, or similar things into this kind of general framework. Uh, and that can be done in, um, in two closely related ways. One, one infodimensional and one sort of by taking the limit of finite dimensional pictures. But um, <coughs> so the, the infinite dimensional <coughs> approach the, the relevant relevant group is um, the G is the symplectic diffeomorphism group. So we have a we have a Kähler manifold uh, X but we, we can just forget about the complex structure and just think about the it's a symplectic manifold uh, and um, all the symplectic forms under consideration will be equivalent as symplectic forms, so it doesn't matter which one we choose. Probably more precisely we should call it the Hamiltonian uh, diffeomorphism group or something, but that's not going to be important. Um, and, the, and we can think of this as acting, so A will be the set of uh, almost complex structures, compatible almost complex structures. I, we, we, we fix this symplectic form and then we can look at this thing uh, and you can write down in a formal way, these are infinite dimensional spaces, but you can write down in a formal way the structure that we had, a, a symplectic form and metric of sort of an infodimensional Kähler structure on this and, and, and so forth. Um, then the, 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 the moment map is just given by the, the, the scalar curvature, essentially. So mu of j is essentially the scalar curvature of the metric determined by uh, the, the, the complex structure and the symplectic form. But, but this is actually, this is a, again, this is a, a slight distortion of the truth, but it's, 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 it's true for our purposes. Um, well, so actually, my, my, minus the average value of the scalar curvature. Let's, let's break that down. Just, we just subtract off a constant. So this, so this is a function which is essentially in the dual of the Lie algebra. The, the, the Lie algebra of this is the function, so this is the right kind of thing to be. The dual of the Lie algebra. So the, um, the, the things that we are looking for, the, the things that we expect to meet in this general picture, are just the constant scalar curvature metrics. So it says then what, what gives the constant scalar curvature metrics? That's going to be... I just didn't hear the whole last sentence you just said a minute ago. I'm saying a zero of the moment map oh, will be something with constant scalar curvature, where the scalar curvature is equal to its average value. Gotcha. So, so in fact, we, I don't have almost complex structures, but we're always just going to restrict to the subset of integrable complex structures. In fact, we're going to really restrict to a single orbit in our discussion, so, well, most of the time, so we don't worry about that. <laughs> So you can write down a lot of what we had. What you can't really write down is the complexified group, because that doesn't exist uh, in, in any genuine sense as a group. But you can still you can still make enough sense of it to, to uh, carry through um, essentially everything we've said. In particular. We, 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 we can interpret the, the quotient space GC over G as the spa space of Kähler metrics. On a, if, we, if we fix one complex structure, we can interpret this by thinking of this as an orbit, or the quotient by G of an orbit in the almost complex structures. We can think of this as the familiar space of all Kähler metrics in a given um, Class I, the set of omega naught plus I d bar d phi for some fixed Taylor class. 
So the, the symmetric space structure we expect on this does more or less make sense. Uh, <coughs> it corresponds to writing down a, a Riemannian metric uh, in, introduced by Mabucci, uh, which is just that if, if we take a tangent vector at this we, we, we're at a given point, we take a tangent vector as just given by a change in phi, so we want to say what, what the norm of delta, the norm of a delta phi is, but it's just, it's just the obvious thing. It's the, we take the, um, let's call this thing omega phi, we take the L2 norm with respect to the, with respect to the usual measure determined by this metric. So the only, th the only interesting thing which is happening is that this, me this metric measure is varying as we vary over our space. So let's call this d, d say, d mu phi, say. Uh, then um, we, we want to one, one, uh, we want to make sense of the, the geodesics in this space um, in some form, and these so these are these are functions of, sort of phi t geodesic. Um, th these 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 make if, if you can write it all out, what you find is that these correspond to to solutions of the degenerate. Uh, or the, or the homogeneous Bonjampair equation on a larger space. So if you think of taking x times s1 times an interval, if our t is in our interval, then if we think of, if we think of this as a Kähler potential on this space, but in with the, the circle acting trivially, then we just corresponds to a form which is null. So solving the geodesic equation just corresponds to solving a so this homogeneous so this is essentially deep. If I think of phi as the function of two variables corresponding to this one parameter family, essentially we're looking at the equation d bar d of phi to the m plus one is equal to zero. And we can write down what this uh, functional is corresponding to the norm. It's, so it's called, um, again, it goes back to, to Mabuchi, Mabuchi functional. Uh, which is, it, again, essentially we define, what we define is its derivative. So you need to see that this actually, so we're really defining a one form on our space. You need to see it's a closed one form, so up to a constant defines a function. But that's the case. So the formula again is the, the change in m infinitesimally as we change by phi. We just um, take this scalar curvature minus the average value of the scalar curvature. G mu phi. Does this, does this notation make sense for Um So you see, the, so the, as we see, the the, the, the critical points. I just when the scalar curvature is constant, as we say. Uh, and then there are other things. Went another another um, very basic important functional that comes in is just defined by good i is just defined by taking the integral of delta phi. So this is this is kind of a, a formal setup for understanding the really the constant scalar curvature equ equation on a, on a Kähler manifold. In fact, if we're working if in the right topological setting, if if, our, if we're working in if the Kähler class is the first Chern class of the manifold, then any constant scalar curvature metric will be Kähler Einstein. So by a certain identity. So um, we can think of this as a way of understanding the Kähler Einstein equations also. But in fact, there's a, th that's a rather, <sighs> since it's embedding a problem in a harder problem in a sense, it's embedding a second order equation, a fourth order equation. There's a, there's a more direct, but uh, to me, more mysterious way of uh, 
setting up the Kähler Einstein equations and the functional by this, it's called the Ding functional. Well, let's see. No. Another functional one can define. Uh, which is equal to, we take this, this i, uh, and then we take minus the logarithm of the integral of, which is omega phi, so over x. So this is, this is in the case when the line bundle we're considering over our manifold is equal to um, say the dual of the canonical bundle. So if we have a metric, so if phi is giving us a metric on the line bundle in a more invariant sense, it's really cool. Um, uh, so if we have a metric on this, just corresponds to a volume form. And that's what this is. So, if it, if it, more kind of in, in coordinates, this is essentially e to the phi. So up, up to, a, up to a, a constant factor. So this is this 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 is something we can only define in the in the kind of Kähler Einstein setting. But again, the the um, the critical points are the, uh, the Kähler Einstein matrix. And remarkably, this is a kind of a uh, result of Bo Benson. Uh, this is also convex along GD six. I mean, I, I don't. So there's no way that's true, but it, it's a fact. This is this is also convex. All three of these are convex. All three of these are convex. Uh, well, this is this is linear, in fact, on GD six. This, this is um, yeah. Uh, so th this is convex sort of pi by the general theory, more or less. This is convex by a hard calculation. <laughs> I don't know any kind of a. Um, and that's that's something actually that comes into the story in a rather important way at a technical level in it, uh, later. Uh, in the sense that this this Giudice equation is is a it's not an elliptic equation. Um, one can try to understand it in a certain sense, but solutions will generally have singularities. So if you have um, singularities along your, if you're trying to understand these functionals along a geodesic and you have singularities, it's not quite clear how it's going to work, because what does the scalar curvature mean if you have a very singular thing? But this, this thing is much coarser, it doesn't depend upon semi-derivatives. So, um, I mean, Bowie is the expert side, but, but to roughly, roughly one, can, one can easily produce kind of weak solutions of this equation. And the advantage of this Ding functional is it's still defined along such, it doesn't really, you don't really care about the singularities. Okay, so this is, this is a, um, something about the kind of infodimensional picture. Um, as we say, so uh, because it's infodimensional, you know, hard, hard work is required often to actually make the kind of formal properties work, but it, it gives a, a, context, a context for thinking about things. So another approach is um, by taking the asymptotics in of, 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 of fine dimensional. So here we would just consider, we just think of a uh, varieties in projective, some fixed projective space. Think, so think of this as projective space with its fixed Fubini Studi metric. We can consider, speaking, the set of all varieties of a given numerical invariance. So it's more precisely, we would consider the Chow variety of such a thing. And then um, we have uh, our, our group G would be SU. 
n plus 1 acts on the Chow variety. And, and also the complexification, just so that this is just... And in fact, this, this, this Chow variety can be embedded in some big projective space, so we can reduce to the, the standard picture, uh, if one likes. Well, in any case, there's a, there's a natural um, metric and a line bundle and so forth on this Chow variety, and what you find is that the the, um, the, 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 the moment map of some variety V is just given by, so this, this should be a, um, a, a skewer joint matrix, the Lie algebra here is just given by taking uh, the integral over V of We take this formula. So I'm thinking of Z alpha, the standard coordinates on our projective space. If I make this combination, it's homogeneous, so it's a well defined function in projective space. Uh, this just means we take the trace free part to we project out to get to them. So this is the momentum map for the action on the Chow variety. That's the moment map for the action, yeah. Well, another way of saying that is if we take a fixed, let's focus on a, a given um, one parameter subgroup defined by some A, then mu of V, comma, A is equal to the, the integral over V of HA, where this HA is the standard Hamiltonian on projective space for the, for the corresponding action in projective space. For this, for the one parameter subgroup judged by A, and I'm, I'm probably to put some I's in somewhere to make this correct. So it's a very, it's a very um, uh, natural thing. So let's let's. Um, we want to understand this, uh, this the numerical invariant. When we say when you when we have a we have a fix, something fixed by a one parameter subgroup, we look at the rate of the action on the fiber. Uh, that's just given by well, essentially by this this formula. Um, uh, but let's. Well, <coughs> Let's, uh, when, when we take account of this projection to the Lie algebra, what, what we can write down is the following formula that we call the, the, the Chow invariant. So supposing, supposing V is fixed by X by T, the one from a subgroup, then the, the Chow invariant um, is going to be, is given, we, we write this with the, the trace of A over the dimension, A, which is N plus one, minus um, uh, 1 over the volume of V times the integral of HA. So this is essentially the same formula. All we've done is we've normalized it so that if A is a multiple of the identity, this vanishes. So it's just a sort of normalized version. And then that's what the value value of this. That's that's this numerical invariant that we wrote down. Oh, oh. The, the weight of the action. Oh, so it's a Hilbert Mumford. It's the Hilbert Mumford invariant. Or something? Yeah, the, the the thing we call the I of x uh, lambda. Something like that. Okay. So what, we we we, uh, we go to the we go to the fixed point and then we write down this oh, this sure. weight of the action. And this is it. Um, so, so the, the condition that the Chow, so what, what, what we're interested in is, is, is the condition of stability, or the Chow stability it would be called, would be that this Chow is positive. So what we're saying is that we start with some um, 
maybe we've got a slight clash of notation. Let's call it V naught, say, fixed. V naught. We start with some V. We want to understand if it's Chow stable. What that means is that the, we take all one parameters, any one parameter subgroup, and we flow it till we flow it into something fixed. So we get some V naught. And we want to say we're in a stable situation if this Chow applied to the fixed thing is positive. And that's, that's quite a natural meaning. What that's saying is that. Uh, so the trace of, th this is just the average value of h on projected space. This is the average value of h on, on v naught. So the stability condition is when we flow uh, sort of downwards, which is when we, when we complexify, we're taking the gradient flow of h. When we flow under the gradient flow of h downwards, the average value in the limit should be less than the average value on the ambient space. So you sort of feel that ought to, you know, you sort of feel, unless it gets hung up in some bizarre way, that should be true, and that's what we're, what we're saying. The integral of h, that, what's that the integral over? So this, the, this, this thing is the average value of h over, over, over projective space. But the next, the next integral that's over v naught. This is v naught, yeah. yeah. So this is the average value over v naught. So I mean, this, is, this is something we could write down for a general kind of in a Romanian context, we say we're looking at submanifolds that when you flow down, the average value in the limit is less than the average value on the, the ambient space. So this is um, this is a notion of Chow stability for something in a fixed projected space, which is which is say quite a natural thing, something one can understand. But we want to think about the, the, the asymptotics of that. So now we're going to... The notation's going a bit weird. So now going back to the picture of a, a, an X with an L, for each, for each K, we can embed X in some... Well, if K is sufficiently large, we can embed by the linear system of sections of this thing in projective space, and then we can apply this picture. On the other hand, if I have a... Um, so let's... Uh, supposing V naught is... Supposing we take K equals 1, and V naught appears there, then we can, re we can take the sections of... We can re-embed it in a bigger space by taking the powers of the sections. So we can get the same V naught we can, we can also have this line bundle L on it. So rather than having a single, so now we would like AK to be the generator of the action on H naught of V naught L to the K, somewhat changing my notation. Yep. So, so we have a V naught, this line bundle over it, it uh, the, the, this automorphism acts on all these spaces, and so we get this. And so we can write down this uh, expression, not for all possible k's. Um, so we so we trace a k over this this, well, this n k we're calling it n k plus one um, minus. Um, well, but we'll take the same this this. This sort of hammer, this integral actually won't won't vary with k. If we normalize up to up to some sort of normalization, this is independent of k. Integral. Um, uh, so maybe I should put a k, uh, but I should uh, so I put a k in here to make it exactly right. V zero is going to depend on k, right? Sorry? Because you, the v zero is going to depend on k because the Chow variety you're going to be in is going to depend on k. Uh, yeah, no, what I'm doing is I'm, uh, so I'm slightly switching between different things. I'm saying let, once we've got a V0, now we can take, we've got a line bundle over it, now we can take the powers of the line bundle to get a whole. In a different we can embed it in a different projective space. You're looking at child varieties for different projective spaces. Then, there, then it'll be in a different, yeah, so that's v0 right. So, so V0, we're essentially embedding it by the, 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 the Veronese. All the different V0s yeah. in some sense. Well, it's the same V0, but we're embedding it in bigger and bigger projective spaces. Embedded different assets. Yeah. Okay. That's right. So I'm, I'm slightly. Uh, oh, I see. Yeah. So we can write down this thing. Um, 
but the, these, at least when k is large, these things have, um, these are given by Hilbert polynomials. These are polynomial functions. And uh, where we've normalized it, this thing will have a limit as k tends to infinity, just by general. This will be a polynomial of degree n plus 1 in k, and this will be a polynomial of degree n in k. So we've got the, and, and, um, yeah, the, 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 for the way we set it up, the top terms cancel, so the next term is a constant, not a constant. And this is, this is the, the Futaki invariant of, well, maybe you call it V naught A, or E to the AT or something. V naught with this action, essentially. So might it happen that this, the quantity in the parentheses is negative for some low values of K? And then oh yes, yeah, we don't, we don't, this could jump around, we don't, it's just in principle it could, exactly, yeah. <coughs> So, that, um, and in fact, there are slight, when we go to this asymptotics, there's, slight, there's uh, some subtleties. So, th things that ought to be this, look as they ought to be the same at first sight actually could be a little bit different. But, uh, but anyway, th this is this is this is a, a correct f this is a formula that defines a certain numerical invariant, and that's what we're going to use to define stability. I'm having kind of, so, in a sense, we could have cut out the last. 40 minutes and just written down the definition. The last 40 minutes has been given, say, why we're defining it in the way we're defining it. We need another lecture then, I think. Yeah. I'm sorry? I think we need another lecture. Well, we're, having, we're going to get one more. Oh, what time? What time is it going to be? Uh, tomorrow. Uh, tomorrow afternoon. Uh, Yeah, we'll see. Well, it could be at, at 12 or something like that. If, if we, we can discuss what time. Yeah, yeah, but, yeah, but you're right. I'm not going to. But you know, I, I think it's worth explaining that you know, rather than just writing down that. Anyway, so now, we, now we're going to get sort of definite, the definition of, of K stability. Um, so when we're, when we're talking about, we start, we take a V or, and, and we move it by one, by one primary subgroup to get a V naught, uh, that's actually the same as talking about, that's equivalent to talking about a family uh, over C, <coughs> which got a flat family or something like that. So I'm, I'm, I'm going to change my notation. So this, this, is, this is supposed to be C star equivariant. So as we, the C star acts on C in the usual way, we're supposed to have a lift of the action to here. Uh, we're supposed to have pi minus 1 of t is isomorphic to x for, for non-zero t. But uh, pi minus 1 of 0, we should think of as being something different, uh, x naught. So we're going back to about x's rather than v's here, yeah. the same thing. Uh, and we also have line bundles uh, on top of everything, but let's not write that down. Uh, so the, the, the Futaki invariant, change of notation, of this uh, gadget uh, is, um, is, just the, is just the Futaki invariant of x naught with the, the action. The C star action gives an action on the fiber over zero. Um, and, and the thing we define there. So this is a good um, algebra geometric definition because it doesn't really matter. I mean, this makes sense even if this is a scheme or whatever. All you need to know is that these things are given by Hilbert polynomials to, to, get, to, get a, to have a good definition. What does it have to do with our other picture, our kind of infinite dimensional picture, um, with differential geometry? 
that at least if um, if x naught is let's say smooth initially uh, or not too singular let's say then we can write down the um, we can write down a formula is this is essentially what we have written down before it's given by taking the the Hamiltonian for the action and pairing it with the, the scalar curvature minus the average value so this is um, this is essentially a version of the Riemann rock theorem in a sense when you, when you, there are, there are the kind of Riemann rock type formulae for this that expresses this in terms of cohomology. You write that in terms of differential forms, and you get such a formula. So th this is if x is sufficiently smooth. I h is h is the Hamiltonian. For the induced action on this central f on this so central fiber. H, sort of uh, H well A is the action on the uh, yeah. yeah, it's right, exactly. It's what we call H A. Yeah. Well, one thing I don't understand is you have this C star action, but over here you you had like an ambient projector space, so you had like an ambient this ambient unitary group and mm -hmm. but why here we just have a sort of abstract family of varieties. Do you put them all in some big projector space or something, and then this? Yeah, you can pass between the two pictures. You can, um, if, you, if you have this, you take the direct. Im you, you, you have this picture. You yeah. take the you take the direct image of the the h naught of l to the k, and that's a, you oh, trivialize that here, yeah. and then you, uh, and, then you the and you put them in a big projector space. Yeah. One parameter group sits in the GLN, yeah. and then you're over in the other picture. Yeah, yeah. It's essentially, yeah, certainly. Yeah. Almost the question I was asking you yesterday about trying to, yeah, right. It's, it's, it's all on one flat. Yeah. You, you, you need to understand equivariant bundles, vector bundles over C, but you you, you do so. So as you say, the, 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 this is the definite, so the K stability, let's not write it, but we've written, it says that if we have a given X, so really, we should have a look at this line bundle as well, is, is stable if any time you fit it into a, a family like this, with this sort of generation, or test configuration, as it's called, um, this Futaki invariant is positive, essentially, with, with some, uh, some extra few words to cover borderline cases, but that's, that's the point. It's the case stability of X. It's the case stability of X. Uh, yes. And we can put X in this yeah. family. Then, then, then yeah. that should be positive. But there is a kind of infinite-dimensional well, the, the related infinite-dimensional discussion in which you, you can translate these uh, one-parameter subgroups into geodesic rays, or at least formally, that's what you should expect. So there's a kind of a, an infinite dimensional notion where you say, you look at, you look at geodesic rays and you want, um, uh, well, you can, you, 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 can, you can define the Futaki invariant that way, essentially, essentially from the limit of the derivative of this Babucci functional, it's the same thing. Yeah. <coughs> Do you ever look at those geodesic rays as, going to, as corresponding to points at infinity? You know, you can compactify a symmetric space. Well, uh, yeah, that, that's the kind of thing one... Uh, right, but that... I mean... <laughs> I mean so, so what I'm saying is, to a certain extent, people have made sense of this kind of thing. And, yeah. and proved that if you have this algebra geometric picture, you can get a... a, re, a, in, a in a suitable weak sense, a, a, a GT6 ray. So, so roughly, we should think of all these algebraic degenerations, as you say, as points at infinity you in know, this space. but impacted by symmetric spaces by looking at equivalence classes of geodesic rays. Yeah. Right, but, it, but I, I, mean, I doubt any of that works yeah, on the nose because it's all, yeah. but, but, but it, 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 it at least works enough to see that you have, this is the right definition to be working with. A, a good definition to be working with. So, so this is, this is essentially, 
Well, what, what we're writing down is very close to, to what was defined by Tian about in the, in the 1990s. Um, what, at a technical level, you get different definitions depending on just what kind of singularities you allow in your x noughts. So, uh, so actually, let me just mention that, in, in, in fact, we can, we can set things up, we can set the definitions up a bit differently in the way that we don't need this um, C star action. Um, and and, in, in, and if, uh, at the end of the day, you get the same concept. Um, so let me just explain how they Supposing you just know you have a family X over, well, just say over a disk, say, no, no uh, with um, pi minus 1 of t isomorphic to X, for, to our fixed X for all non zero t. Then Rather than thinking about the, the weights of this action and, and so forth, what we've been doing, you can also think about there's a certain, both for the Chow and for the Futaki story, they, they correspond to certain line lines that you can functorally as, cor make correspond to a variety. So, in a certain way, you, can, you have a variety, you write down in a canonical way a line is associated to it. So, uh, if you believe that, then Given this family, we get a line bundle over the disk, not very interesting, but this isomorphism means that the line bundle is trivialized away from zero. So we have a, we have a, we have a relative Chern class integer invariant. And a line bundle on delta trivialized over. over. Delta star. So it implies degree, and that's and that's the same as the with the other thing that we defined. Is that line the of the uh, it can be formed from those, yes, or, or from this. Um, there's a construct. There's this Deline construction of. Um, of way of sort of pushing down line bundles. It's, it's not, uh, or various ways of writing it. Okay, so finally, I think we can get on to the, um, maybe for time, these metrics with cone singularities. So uh, it'll fit in best the way things are turning out to postpone any kind of analysis. About the, I was going to talk about the linear elliptic theory on these a bit, but that, let's, let's postpone that to the, to the, the next lecture. But let's just see how we can fit into this kind of Futaki invariant story. Uh, so what, what we're considering, of course, is the model cone with angle beta is given by this metric in, in polar coordinates. Like cone angle 2 pi beta. So we're, we're, we're going to we'll say more, something more precise about this. We're going to consider um, some d in x, more precisely in uh, the linear system uh, minus mu times k for some fixed mu, positive mu. Um, and we, we're going to consider Kähler metrics, which have got this, which have got a singularity modelled on this transverse to D. But, but, but let's um, not go into any kind of more detail. But let's just say that we can think, well, in a certain well, natural sense, which also could be made rigorous, we can think of the um, such a metric, the curvature. For example, the scalar curvature having a delta function contribution along d. You take a, this, this cone you can think of in the two-dimensional picture as having Gauss curvature, a delta function at the origin. <laughs> so. 
So now we want to define a, a, a modified Futaki invariant. I mean, in fact, we can modify the whole story, all this stuff, for, to put these divisor in, but, but the, the crucial thing is the Futaki invariant of um, to change notation, I seem to have got, let's call it, z supposing ch change, to, to fit in what we want to do later, let's, let's take z rather than x and delta rather than d, we want to define the Futaki invariant with this parameter beta of this pair, oh, when we have a, so we have, we have a C star action on, on this setup, pre preserving. Um, so what, what, what we can, what, what we, what, 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 let's write down the formula. This is the ordinary Futaki invariant as we defined before, plus. Um, Excuse me. Plus a plus a plus a, uh, a correction term, which essentially is the integral of the Hamiltonian over delta. Then we need, but we'll put a bit of a, some of the normalizing factor in as well. So. So this is a definition, um, and again, this, this, we can also express this algebra geometrically if we want in terms of, by writing these as the leading term in Hilbert polynomials. Um, why is this a, 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 a good definition? If we think of, if we take our previous formula for the Futaki invariant, but now we substitute in the so we compute using the scalar curvature, but now, now the scalar curvature should have this delta function term on D. But now we sub that's precisely this, or minus this. So we're just subtracting off the delta function term. So this is equal to, the, let's write the integral over Z minus delta, to emphasize, of uh, S minus S hat. I, the scalar curvature not including the delta function contribution. That's what I mean by this integral. So this has precisely got the property that this vanishes if um, we have a metric of, of, of if we have a metric of constant scalar curvature away from with this delta function singularity, this thing will be zero. So I can, let's go back now finally to, um, to, to discuss the strategy as I, as I re pretty much repeat what I said at the end of my talk on Friday, but now we have more background to understand it. Um, so this is... We, we um, well, for reasons I won't go into, uh, there, there, there is a, a Kähler Einstein, for, for small beta, there is, a, there, there, is a, um, there is one of these Kähler Einstein metrics for, 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 for some values of beta, particularly small. And also, the set, of, the set where you have a solution is open, so you can deform things. So what we want to know is, starting from some small value where we have this metric with a cone singularity, we <coughs> I wanted to deform it all the way up to beta equals one. <coughs> so, um, so let's uh, so the, the, the crucial thing is the closeness. See, we, we we want to say if we have some sequence beta i increasing to a limit beta infinity, and we have solutions x. Well, actually, x i will be x, but it's more convenient to call it x uh, x i. Um, solutions. What we want to do, we want to be able to say we can do for these singular metrics just what we did for the ordinary metrics in the first talk yesterday. So we want to have some limit 
we want to have the gromov hausdorff limit, which has actually got an algebraic metric structure. Um, and we're going to have carry on that we have these di's as well in, in the natural way z done so we want one I said the words we want, we want we want to have a limit which is an algebraic geometric thing an algebraic variety super kind uh, secondly we want to fit uh, one of these C star equivariant families uh, such that um, um, such that the central fiber is Z, but of course we're, we're going to have the divisor as what we're going to have the family with the original D and the this divisor delta in the, in the obvious way. Uh, and secondly, we want to be able to say that the Futaki invariant for this beta infinity of x is zero. That's, that's fine, that's all to say. But those are the three things we want to establish. About that. Um, because if we've done that, then we're We've proved our theorem, and we've proved that essentially because this this Futaki invariant of beta is just linear. We didn't write it down. It just varies linearly with beta. Um, so the, you know, the by the it's what the easy direction is normally called in this theory. Uh, when you do have a solution, the thing was stable. So the Futaki invariant back here was positive. And the, the various there are various ways of proving that, there are various proofs in the literature. Um, it was, it was um, zero here, so when we went out to one, which is when it's the ordinary Futaki invariant, it has to be negative. Of course, I mean, there's, a, there's a special case when beta infinity is one, and then you have to you know, get, but the, you, you get the idea. Okay. okay, that's a good place to stop. I mean, but, but um, more or less, I've, I haven't got past my we were on Friday, but I, I, kind of, I hope I've explained the. These are these are totally technical things to do. Uh, you, you should, well, yeah, well, you know, if you're not coming tomorrow, you should believe that this this is a variant of. Uh, it needs more work, but it's a variant of what we did before. It's the same idea. Um, this is well. This requires some some technical words and well, quite a lot of technical work, but it's not. Not too hard to believe. This is this is. I mean, formally you'd expect this because uh, we're also going to have a limit of our metrics in some sense here, um, which is going to have a, a singularity along delta uh, in some sense. And if everything was sufficiently smooth, then um, you know, the formula we wrote this would this would be a constant scalar curvature metric. So the, if we could apply the differential geometry formula, this thing this would be true. So, what 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 the, what the work involves? This involves again involves you know, deep work. But what it involves with is involved is saying that the singularities are not too bad so that the differential geometry still works. Interesting. Okay, so I stopped.